something what we, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and many Spanish companies, along with members of um, civil society, really, really appreciate. The special relationship, we, we have a special relationship with the Department for International Trade. And I thank also Michael Charlton, who in the last couple of years has been a critical in facilitating this. Um, the Spanish Chamber of Commerce remains open and active, and like everyone else, we are adapting to the new circumstances. And more importantly, we continue thinking forward. There is a human drama um, behind these um, coronavirus um, pandemia. And any of us, directly or indirectly, have been affected in one shape or form. Indeed, the world, as we have known it in the past 40 years, has come to stop. We have a supply chain crisis, we have a demand crisis, a labor market crisis, and an oil prices crisis. Things will change, we are told every day, but some things will not change. Uh, it was an illustrious British man, Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations a couple of centuries ago and linked the wealth of nations to international trade. Although things will change, trade and investment will remain essential and only companies can create the jobs, provide opportunities and change communities. This is why it's so important that we engage with Hamas's government today. We've been following very closely the government's measures to support businesses across the United Kingdom. The trade relation between Spain and the United Kingdom, which the minister no doubt will elaborate in a uh, few minutes, has actually doubled up in the last two years. Many Spanish companies come to the UK because of a large, mature and sophisticated market. Never before this public and private cooperation has been so necessary. When things come to normal, and they will, companies will be critical to ensure we, have a, we make a smooth comeback. Each institution will, will play its role and responsibility in this crisis. And we, at the Spanish Chamber of Commerce in the United Kingdom, are determined to continue working closely with the Department for International Trade and to continue helping our members and patrons. I am therefore pleased to have the Minister Greg Hans with us. And I will hand over now to our Treasurer, Nacho Moraes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Well, thank you, Minister. Today, I'm grateful to, to welcome and the Right Honorable Red Hans, Minister of State for Trade Policy at the Department of International Trade, who is also my local MP and a, a good friend and a good friend of the, of the chamber. We especially thank your availability under these current circumstances. We were planning to make a, a presential event out of this breakfast and when the situation changed, the minister was kind enough to accept uh, to change it into this new online format we are inaugurating. Praise is also due to the DIT team who has helped us in this uh, happening. Then the minister is a good friend of the chamber and he's fondly remembered as speaker in other occasions, such as our New Year during reception or the Spanish Financial Forum. Uh, Greg Hans was um, born in New York to British parents and moved to the UK at the age of seven. Later, uh, before uh, reading modern history at Cambridge University, he, he traveled to uh, West Berlin and then through uh, East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia and Romania, and uh, already fluent in German and French, Hell, uh, Greg also learned Czech and Slovak uh, during his university years. He was uh, during those years as well, the chairman of the Cambridge University Conservative associations. We, we can see the, the strong link that that Greg uh, has has with with Europe. Uh, once uh, completing uh, his studies, he, he embarked on a career in the city, where he worked in derivatives uh, during eight years in banking in London and New York. So his first uh, foray in, in the political arena was in '98 when he was elected councillor at the Hammersmith and Fulham Council and where he was uh, like leader of the conservative group. 
in 2005, he was elected uh, for the constituency of, of Hammersmith and Fulham, where, where he, he lives with his uh, wife and children. Uh, and he has been re-elected to the then created a constituency of Chelsea and Fulham in 2010, and since then in 2015, 2017, and 2019. Um, from January uh, 09 to uh, 2010, Greg served as a shadow treasury minister, and after the 2010 general election, he was appointed private uh, parliamentary private secretary to the to the chancellor of the exchequer. In 2011, uh, Greg joined the uh, government whips, starting as assistant government whip, and then being promoted to the deputy chief whip and treasurer of Her Majesty Household in 2013. In 2015. Um, and Greg was appointed chief secretary to the treasury, making him one of the few, I don't know, if not the first person in Britain who has witnessed the, the bond market from the trading and the East ones side. <laughs> and we, we first met actually during those days when we, when we uh, fought together in the Remain trenches in the 2016 referendum. And then under the May administration, Greg was appointed Minister of State in the newly created Department for International Trade, uh, a position he, he resigned from uh, 2018 in order to meet his election commitments uh, on voting against the Hitler expansion. Uh, as an adventure, he also had a fertile activity, whose good probably was the Alternative Arrangements Commission which he uh, co-chaired with actually our prior guest in the Business Breakfast series, Baroness Morgan. This was the first uh, structured path to break stalemate in the Irish situation and help greatly to find a solution which was finally included into the withdrawal agreement. Uh, on February this year, he was appointed Minister of State of State Trade Policy, again in the Department of International Trade, and, this uh, makes him having served therefore in ministerial roles for three different prime ministers. And before I hand the uh, virtual uh, floor to Greg, I wanted also to uh, welcome Michael Charlton, Managing Director and Chief Investment Officer in the Department for International Trade, who has always been a great supporter of the Chamber, having joined us uh, in instances such as the uh, Investment Barometer last year. So Greg, the, the floor is yours. Uh, brilliant. Well, thank you, um, Nacho. Hopefully um, everybody can hear me um, fine. Um, but thank you very much indeed, everyone, for joining us today. And a uh, particular word of thanks to the Spanish Chamber, which I always find uh, one of the very best organised uh, chambers uh, here in the UK and doing uh, amazing work. I'm going to talk a little bit about the trade and investment links. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, where I see the future of UK-Spanish relations. Uh, and also a little bit about the future of trade and what impact um, COVID-19 uh, might have on the global trade uh, debate. But, but thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Nacho. Um, I think this is the third or fourth event uh, that I've done with you in the last uh, two or three years. Um, as I say, always very, very well organized and very worthwhile events. And it's great to be back at the Department for International Trade after uh, an 18 month uh, break. Um, pretty much as soon as I got my feet back under my old desk, um, COVID-19 came along. So that's kind of pretty much consumed most of my time uh, um, so far. But my job is mainly going to be to ordinarily is to look at the UK's future trading relations uh, beyond uh, the EU. Um, so looking at uh, trade agreements uh, with the US, uh, uh, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand uh, and others. Um, so that's kind of what my uh, job would ordinarily be. But at the moment, I'm spending a considerable amount of time uh, working on trade issues in relation to COVID-19. Uh, as you rightly point out, Nacho, I'm also the Member of Parliament for Chelsea and Fulham, so I may well be um, the MP of uh, um, some, maybe many people uh, on this call. And also my thanks to Michael Charlton, uh, my uh, Director of Investment uh, for joining us this morning. Michael has worked in the space of uh, investment into the UK for, oh gosh, at least 10 years um, and was uh, originally at London Partners and has been at our department um, since its inception. So uh, I don't think you'll get anybody uh, more professional and more capable in this space uh, than Michael Charlton uh, at this time. Uh, let me just start off by extending my sympathy to uh, everybody Spanish and everybody in relation to um, trade with Spain. Um, 
every night on the 10 o'clock news, uh, just when I think things are, are, are looking a bit grim in the UK, um, up pops uh, Italy and then Spain and reminds us uh, of the uh, incredible challenge uh, being faced uh, uh, by Spain at the moment. Uh, and our sympathies go out with everybody uh, involved in Spain. And uh, I think we all uh, admire the fortitude of the uh, Spanish people uh, at this uh, very, very uh, difficult time. But I think as allies, uh, we also need to work together to make sure that uh, trade flows and that markets uh, remain open. Uh, and I'm pleased that a lot of the cooperation between our two countries remains very strong. Uh, UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab and his Spanish counterpart, Arancha Gonzalez Laya, have been working very closely to ensure that uh, everybody gets home if that's what they want to do uh, uh, each way and vice versa. We've also been having a lot of constructive talks with each other at the G20 uh, and at the WTO in relation to trade and the impact of COVID-19 on it. Uh, and we've been absolutely clear, and I think it's in both countries' interests, um, that uh, when it comes to um, trade in uh, medical equipment and medical supplies, um, that, uh, 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 that this be kept as open as possible. Uh, if there have to be suspensions, then these suspensions should be proportionate, uh, time limited and transparent. Um, I think if everybody uh, um, merely prevented the export of all of their uh, medical goods, medical devices, it would soon become a zero sum game. Uh, and I don't think would uh, save lives, but rather the opposite. But of course, this is not just a public health emergency, it's also an economic emergency. Um, so the Department for International Trade, we've written to over a thousand contacts in British and Spanish businesses uh, and asked for feedback as to what impact uh, COVID-19 is having on their business and how we might uh, support them. And obviously moving further forward, uh, once the crisis uh, uh, abates, uh, we need to ensure that UK and Spanish companies take advantage, the best advantage of the opportunities that present themselves once the crisis is over. And that's what I'd also like to focus on uh, today. Um, in our trading relationship, uh, both Eduardo and Nacho mentioned how strong it is. Um, and uh, we work very well together on an institutional basis at the WTO, for example, uh, seeking, uh, working together to make sure the Apple body uh, um, is, is re-established and back up and running um, and working together on that situation. Um, and in terms of our uh, trading relationship, I mean, total trade between us um, continues or has, at least until this crisis, continued to go uh, from strength to strength. Um, £52 billion pounds sterling uh, last year, um, which is an increase of 4.4% over the previous year. Um, Spain is the UK's seventh largest trading partner, accounting for 3.7% of total UK trade. And it's actually one of the most diverse uh, trading relationships um, from the automotive sector uh, to food and drink, finance to telecoms. Uh, it is a very, very strong relationship. And the UK actually exports uh, more to Spain than three of the BRICs combined, Russia, Brazil and India. Um, so our trading relationship there is extremely important. And for many Spanish regions, the UK is actually the number one market uh, for exports. Uh, and actually, Spain is the UK's number one provider of, uh, uh, number one supplier of fresh food uh, from outside of the UK. And on services, uh, the UK is Spain's number one trading partner, eclipsing the huge revenue generated uh, even by British tourism. Spain is actually the largest European investor in the UK financial sector. Uh, I think Santander, Banco Sabadell and others are on the line. Uh, and also Spain makes most of the many of the most popular cars on uh, British roads. And as we saw at the UK Spain Trade and Investment Awards in February, uh, our bilateral relationship goes from strength to strength. And in reverse, the UK is the second largest investor into Spain and is actually on track or had been on track uh, to overtake the United States uh, to become the world's largest foreign investor into Spain uh, this year. And since 1993, uh, the UK has represented 21% of all foreign direct investment uh, into Spain. And the number of direct and indirect jobs that Spanish companies, so British companies are responsible for in Spain, numbered 240,000 
uh, uh, last year, according to the British Chamber of Commerce in Spain. And meanwhile, Spanish investments in the UK totaled around 50.2 billion pounds, uh, 56 billion euros, uh, up 5.2% uh, on the previous year. Now, I'm uh, as I'm conscious of the fact a lot of the companies, uh, and I'm going to mention are on this call. So I'm not going to canter through every sort of single case of investment, but um, I think some Spanish companies are very, very high profile in the UK. Um, Santander with 600 branches, uh, Inditex, the Zara owners have got 100 stores, uh, Repsol has invested 1.6 billion pounds in the North Sea oil facilities, uh, Celnex uh, is huge in the UK, uh, and actually has got a 2.2 billion pound deal on acquiring a UK Archivas telecommunications uh, division. Talgo have selected Longanet in Scotland as the location for their new manufacturing facility and Chesterfield in Derbyshire for an innovation center. Ferrovial, and I'm not gonna get sidetracked down to talk about Heathrow Airport, but Ferrovial uh, has also um, taken on uh, big contracts in relation to high speed two. Uh, we all admire how high-speed rail has expanded uh, across Spain. I think uh, Spain has got the largest high-speed rail network anywhere in the world. Uh, and the UK is looking to work with uh, Spanish companies in bringing a lot of that technology and capability to this country. Uh, Dragados uh, will also build the London terminus for HS2. So a big uh, amount of work going on there. And on the other way, as I mentioned, the UK becoming uh, the largest foreign investor in Spain. Um, we've got 700 companies operating in Spain, uh, uh, large uh, and small. So rather than just read you a list of superlatives, why don't I tell you a little bit about how the Department of International Trade uh, can help. Uh, once this pandemic is over, we need obviously to make, be ready to make the best of the opportunities that are out there. Um, so let me explain what the UK government is doing to help Spanish companies enter trade and expand in the UK market. The Department of International Trade is the UK's government's international economic department responsible for promoting and supporting UK trade across the world and attracting foreign investment into the UK. We offer a range of support mechanisms to potential investors, including detailed market insights, investment opportunities, local information, and introductions to take your business forward. We've got DIT experts spread across the world working with potential investors to help them invest and grow in the UK. We provide expert advice on everything from opening bank accounts to paying taxes, financial modeling to visas, research, and accessing finance. And if you're already established in the UK and looking to expand, we can help you develop the right relationships to expand into global markets. Anything from innovation support uh, for new products and services um, to using our overseas network to help grow your experts, uh, exports from your bases in the UK. Another great reason to invest in the UK is our world leading UK export finance, uh, export credit agency, whose mission is to ensure that no viable UK export fails due to lack of finance or insurance. And through its 50 billion pound export finance capacity, 50 billion pound capacity, we can provide multiple uh, support products. Uh, for example, just in January, uh, UKEF announced it would guarantee 47.6 million pounds worth of financing for the UK based company Solar Century uh, to build two of the largest solar plants uh, in Spain, one in Extremadura and another in Sevilla. And they'll be capable of producing energy, enough energy to power 150,000 homes every year while helping tackle climate change uh, in both our countries, a key priority for both of us. So that's how the many ways how the Department of International Trade uh, can help. Let me uh, talk briefly about uh, uh, the UK having left the European Union and where that uh, takes us now. Um, and it's more important than ever in the time of this uh, global crisis uh, to make clear to our friends in the European Union and to Spain that just because the UK has left the European Union uh, does not mean that we are leaving Europe. Uh, the EU will continue to be a valued friend, partner and market, of course, uh, for the UK. So we want to establish a relationship with the EU which is based on friendly cooperation between sovereign equals centred on free trade and inspired by our common history and common values. The question now 
is uh, what will the trading relationship look like uh, on and after the 1st of January. Uh, you'll have seen what the UK government is seeking is an agreement uh, uh, similar to the one the EU has with Canada. Um, and uh, rather than trying to avoid uh, what the situation might be if we had a situation more akin to, say, Australia's. Uh, naturally, the coronavirus poses challenges, as it does in so many other things, uh, but both sides remain committed to continuing these negotiations. Uh, um, but uh, whatever happens uh, in our future relationship there, the UK remains very open to foreign investment, and we're also encouraging investment uh, into Spain. And we value the contribution that the Spanish and all EU citizens uh, make to the UK. I'm married to an EU citizen. She's uh, in this home at the moment, so I better be careful what I say. Um, but that's why we have made it a priority to safeguard the rights of EU citizens living in the UK and UK nationals living in the EU, uh, which I think Spain is the largest destination uh, country. So Britain is open for business, uh, and this will uh, 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 obviously notwithstanding the current crisis, and uh, we remain open for Spanish investment. Uh, as I will say, I like to make sure the UK is the most uh, friendly country for foreign investors. Uh, so long as foreign investors uh, obey our rules, uh, pay our taxes, and employ our people, I think the UK is one of the uh, uh, most uh, uh, open markets in the world, if not the most open, um, to foreign companies coming in and running key industries. The UK, of course, remains the world's fifth largest economy and the world's largest service exporter outside of the United States. We are and will remain a country that is open to foreign investment and open to trade with a pro-business attitude, highly skilled workforce, four of the world's top 10 universities, centers of innovation and excellence, and formidable networks across the globe. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm confident that whatever the outcome of our negotiations for the EU, the UK's future relationship with the EU, trade will continue to be extremely important for both partners. The UK is and will remain an active member of the international community, uh, supportive of the rules-based international system, a close ally of Spain in international fora, defence allies through our joint membership of NATO, and of course, of exceptionally strong bilateral investment and trading partner. And as we recover from the impact of COVID-19, it'll be businesses like yours that will be at the forefront of our relationship and our recovery. Well, that's what um, I wanted to say to you today, but I've got one last and uh, very important uh, uh, message um, for you all. And that is this, that I think once the crisis starts to abate, attention will turn, of course, to learning the lessons from COVID-19. Uh, and international trade will undoubtedly be uh, one of the areas of focus. Uh, people may well ask why individual countries uh, face shortages or slowness in supply in anything from paracetamol to ventilators, from virus tests to rubber gloves, from PPE to face masks. And this could even extend to food and other essential sectors, although at the moment uh, those supplies uh, are remaining extremely strong. And there will undoubtedly be some who will say that the answer is some kind of self-sufficiency, the ability or even actuality of producing all of this stuff domestically. And I say, I think that would be the wrong approach to retreat to 19th century autarky. Of course, it'll be necessary to look at individual sectors and see where domestic capability uh, can be improved and can be mobilized. But it's worth remembering that the only country in the world uh, which has self-sufficiency as its official ideology uh, is North Korea. And look now at where that country is today. But the answer is not autarky, uh, but in international trade. We need to diversify our sources of supply. We need to make sure that our supply chains are resilient and we need to make maintain our options for sourcing essentials and near essentials. Those are what I think will be the lessons uh, in the trade space of the COVID-19 crisis. So I'm convinced the free markets and free trade uh, provide the answers, uh, but that monopolies have always been the enemy of free markets. So I call on everybody on this call today to help make this case. The world needs to remain interconnected, international trade, and diverse sources of supply are the solution, 
not the problem. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Thank you, it has been a splendid uh, overview. I, I would like to know now to, to invite all, all participants to, to submit their questions. They can uh, use the, the Q&A facility in the, in the, in the uh, application. And, and they can uh, submit it there. We have the, the first question from Antonio Hernandez from uh, KPNG. And um, well, many thanks, uh, Minister, for this conference. And due to the uh, COVID crisis, is the UK government to ask for an extension of the negotiation process to avoid uh, an edge? called in, in January 2021? Uh, no, um, there's no need. We don't see a need um, to seek an extension. Uh, we think the sort of deal that the UK is looking for is based uh, very much on existing uh, precedent uh, um, in terms of the Canadian deal uh, and other deals that the EU uh, has made uh, with other like-minded, friendly, free market democracies, uh, we are something looking for something similar. We don't see uh, a need to uh, extend uh, that uh, transition period. Um, thank you very much. Um, let me um, get uh, another question then from one of our uh, participants. In this case, um, Juan Botin uh, from uh, Santander will be uh, asking the question. So um, let me uh, unmute him. So Juan, please uh, go ahead. Good morning, Greg. Uh, thank you very much. Morning, for Juan. Morning. Morning. Thank you very much for thinking. It's a pleasure to have my MP living in Fulham for the oh. last six years. So that's, that's a great news. So that's congratulations for what you are doing for, for the area. Uh, I have I a think couple I recognize of... your name from the electoral register. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. The first thing is a question more regarding, is more regarding the, the, the specific uh, coronavirus. This is the you know that the Chancellor announced the coronavirus business interruption loan schemes uh, in in around the 20th of March, and this is this is a, a plan that is I think is starting operating from let's say Monday 23rd of March, and, and Santander is one of the bank that is supporting and working under this government uh, back uh, coronavirus uh, interruption loan scheme. And I think. Uh, for, for the information of everybody, this scheme is, is, is aimed to supporting a small and medium sized company up to 45 billion turnover. And I think we are, I think we are trying to help find anything is going well. But is today, it's just limit to this amount. And we can see that there is a, some medium sized company over that amount that probably will be happy to join this, this scheme. Are the government thinking to increase the, the facility in the possibility to incorporate it new, new companies? This, this is one of, of the first question. And the second is a combination of, of what you have time to explain. We are going to a post-crisis COVID-19 difficult situation, probably we are going to a recession. And at the same time, UK is thinking to leave the UK from the 1st of January 2001. It's not so challenged. So could be not considering, let's, let's try to be a little bit provocative. It's not the perfect storm to, to manage the situation for 2001, 21. Thank you very much, Greg. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Juan. Let me um, try and give you some answers on uh, each of those. I think on the the C-Bill scheme, um, the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme, uh, you're right that it is set um, for uh, companies with less than £45 million turnover. Uh, of course, we do have, as you know, a host of other uh, measures in place um, to uh, help uh, larger companies, like, for example, the uh, job retention scheme, uh, the VAT holiday, um, business rates holiday, uh, and uh, 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 the business grant scheme as well. Um, I think in terms of whether the C-Bill scheme should be extended to larger companies, uh, let me pass that on to um, the Treasury in terms of that. Obviously, all of these schemes are under constant review. As you all know, they have to be uh, put in place uh, really very sharply. Uh, the legislation that I helped pass through the House of Commons uh, just two weeks ago, um, and all of these schemes are under review. So if I can uh, reflect that uh, uh, back to the Treasury, perhaps if you could write to me or contact my officials um, uh, offline, perhaps giving some examples of the sort of companies and why you think uh, who would like to be in this scheme, why they feel that other parts of you know, at the moment, there's a whole menu of five or six really major, huge government schemes going on. Uh, and I'm not sure, you know, obviously the interaction between those schemes um, is crucial, uh, which schemes help uh, some companies more than others. So it'd be helpful to get, just get from you um, some kind of feeling as to if there's anybody who's sort of falling between the gaps uh, on some of these schemes who needs um, support that isn't currently there. I mean, you'll know the, the principle of the UK government is to uh, um, provide um, all support that is reasonably uh, uh, available. Uh, nobody wants to see uh, anybody uh, lose their job or businesses go under uh, solely as a result of COVID-19. That's basically our starting principle. And secondly, in terms of the uh, the perfect storm, well, look, um, you know, businesses have asked for uh, certainty. Uh, I think we have provided the certainty by saying very clearly um, that the transition period won't be extended uh, beyond the 1st of January 2021. Uh, that remains uh, the government's uh, position. Uh, 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 um, that, uh, and that does uh, create the certainty that I think businesses need to help prepare uh, for that event. Um, but clearly there's a lot going on at the moment. Uh, um, and uh, um, uh, the negotiations, <clears throat> I think we'll all be keeping a very close eye on uh, how those progress at the same time. Sorry, so I'm not I'm not able to give you very. Uh, in terms of the first one, I think uh, the, the the Treasury. Uh, I, I I know because I spoke to Treasury officials yesterday. Uh, quite an extensive briefing on some of the support around these schemes, and this is something which is obviously under uh, a constant assessment and review. All of these are quite revolutionary, radical schemes, and the working of these schemes. Uh, you know, if it could be shown that there are. Uh, we start with the objective of wanting, as I said, to make sure no business goes down, nobody loses their job. That is our starting objective. If, if the schemes are not achieving that, then clearly we need to keep those under review. Thanks very much, Craig. Thank you Thank very you much. much. Thank you very much, Juan. Um, now, let me, let me uh, first remind that uh, people can, can make their questions also through through uh, WhatsApp at the number well plus four four seven eight nine four nine one nine four five three I repeat plus four four seven eight nine four nine one nine four five three and then we we continue uh, to to with questions that are coming I will pull a uh, Two questions in one, one from Jose Luis Dominguez from uh, Pacadar and one from Javier Moreno from Renfe. Jose Luis uh, asked that due to the current situation, what's the forecast for the HS2 project and the start of construction stage? And the second from uh, Javier Moreno from uh, Renfe, and that it's related after the, the situation with the COVID regarding infrastructures, do you expect a, con a contraction or a, an expansion of public investment? Yeah. 
Uh, well, thank you, uh, Nacho, and thank you to um, Jose Luis and uh, Javier. Um, I I'll probably bring in Michael Charlton in a moment, um, just on some of the uh, specifics on uh, HS2. Um, I I'm, to be honest, I'm not clear in my own mind what the latest uh, uh, date is in terms of the start of construction, but you know, obviously HS2, the government has been committed to HS2 uh, since it came in in 2010, uh, and uh, most aspects of the uh, of the program are, are, are kind of in full swing. I think in terms of where we go on infrastructure, um, Boris Johnson's been absolutely clear about the importance of uh, spending money on infrastructure. He's given HS2 the green light, um, and also um, before this crisis began, uh, gave a green light to um, a large number of uh, projects, uh, um, particularly connecting projects, uh, particularly in the in the north of England, uh, but also other key infrastructure projects uh, around the UK. But I might just uh, bring in uh, Michael to give a little bit more detail, I think, on uh, HS2 uh, and some of the other uh, infrastructure investments. Uh, Michael. Uh, Greg, uh, thanks very much. I'm not necessarily best placed to give an answer on this question. Apologies, uh, but we can certainly get an update for you. But as you say, um, clearly um, fast moving situation with COVID-19. Uh, but at this point, no indication that the timetable um, and the commitment to HS2 and to other large scale infrastructure projects um, is impacted. Uh, but following this call, I'll speak to my colleague who runs our infrastructure and energy team and provide uh, a more detailed update. Okay, thank you, Mike. The one thing I just add to that is I'm, I'm aware that um, um, Crossrail construction has been uh, suspended in London, but I'm not aware uh, that uh, can HS2 construction uh, across the country uh, has been uh, stopped uh, in the same way. I mean, the guidelines are clear from government. Uh, that if uh, um, social distancing can be maintained on construction sites, uh, then they should uh, continue. Thank you very much. Now, uh, the, the next question will, will come uh, from uh, Javier San Basilio, that if I'm not wrong, uh, he's also one, uh, one constituent uh, of yours. Uh, okay, Javier, you're you're yes. online. Yes, thank you very much, Nacho. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, indeed, uh, another of your constituents, and uh, thank you for your good very work. good. I better be on best behavior. You, know, you, you always are with us. <laughs> I, I know you. I mean, you have to be uh, quite a busy guy these days. Uh, so, uh, really, thank you for uh, for sharing your time with us. And and uh, my question is is uh, very much uh, looking forward beyond the, the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And it's very focused on, uh, on the industry I know, which is the insurance and, and the insurance industry. As, as you are more than aware of, uh, London has traditionally been the, the world capital for this industry. Its attractiveness was the concentration of knowledge, of capital, of resources, the particular network built around uh, a very uh, special institution, which is the Lords of London, and, uh, and the EC3 district, which uh, I think uh, lives very much uh, on, on, the, on the insurance industry. Uh, going forward, and, and uh, with, uh, with the UK uh, leaving the, the European Union, uh, much of our regret, there's nothing we can do about that. I was wondering if, if the government is planning on, 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 uh, on taking any steps to preserve that uh, that capital city status uh, uh, for the city, because uh, there are other contenders, as you know. I mean, uh, capacity has been deployed in, in New York, in Miami, in Singapore, in Shanghai, in Zurich, in many other markets, and we don't want uh, something which is uh, so intrinsic to, to London to lose to lose value. For transnational companies, the ability to do business worldwide from London is is very important. But if we start building uh, too many regulatory barriers on, and hurdles uh, that prevent us from doing business, for example, throughout Europe in multinational placements, that could be a, quite a challenge. I mean, the, the cost of doing business in London in terms of uh, uh, pure business expenses, uh, we know is high, but the, the value of the city deserves that cost. 
But is the government planning on, on establishing a regulation, a regulatory framework that can uh, alleviate those, those hurdles? Or are we going to be, for example, subject to two different solvency regulations, uh, the solvency two for uh, European-based uh, institutions and a particular solvency regime here? Is, is something that, uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of, uh, of people withdrawing from the market or returning to their home base, and I haven't seen many people coming back to London now, and that's just something that is, that is new in our industry. Yeah, uh, well, thank you, Javier, and, and thank you uh, um, for that uh, uh, question. And I was slightly distracted by trying to work out from your backdrop where in Chelsea and Fulham you are, but um, I'm, I'm on a but I won't in, get in that Paddy, road. On a basement um, close to Paddy Bridge. Right, okay. Ah, yeah, okay, yeah. Now I, 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 I can uh -huh. figure the backdrop. Yeah. Um, well, look, um, let, me, uh, let me try and answer generally rather than um, specifically on insurance, although obviously I'm acutely aware of how important the insurance market uh, is uh, in the UK. And, you know, I'm somewhere in the, personally, a little bit in the middle ground on all of this uh, in terms of uh, the UK's, uh, um, uh, the strength of London and the UK as a financial centre. I mean, I think a lot of the, the doom that was forecast if the UK uh, voted to leave, and as Natural rightly points out, uh, I fought her to remain in the European Union. And one of the things that was, what was said at the time was how uh, disastrous leaving uh, would be or could be uh, on uh, the status of the City of London. That's turned out, I think, uh, not to be the case, although, as you may point out, of course, we are still uh, subject to uh, EU regulation and we have a frictionless trade with the European Union at the moment. But uh, I'm confident that London will remain uh, uh, the world's leading financial centre um, and and uh, in, in different outcomes, whatever happens after the 1st of January, personally, I'm very confident we are going to get this Canada-style uh, free trade agreement, uh, which uh, um, is, uh, on the financial services side, is not going to be exactly the same as the position we have at the moment. I recognise that. But I think, in general, the UK and London will remain in an extremely strong position uh, going forward. I strongly believe that uh, the European Union needs access to London's financial market as much as London's financial market uh, needs access to European customers. I think it's strongly in, in both sides' interest to keep that uh, flow open. Um, I don't think another European financial centre uh, is able uh, wholesale to take on uh, the position that uh, London uh, has today. Uh, but equally, I don't want to sound complacent. I mean, I worked in as I think uh, Natural said, I worked in financial services throughout the 1990s, which is now some time ago. But uh, I remember uh, at the time there was quite a few voices in London saying, you know, London will always be the best. We're always going to have everything. And that wasn't always the case. I mean, we uh, uh, lost. Uh, I used to work in derivatives, as Natural said, and we lost the, uh, the Bund Future contract to the Deutsche Terminbörse. That was due to technology rather than any other capability. So it is possible while still retaining a very, very strong financial centre to lose aspects of that. So we have to be very, very careful uh, to make sure um, that the UK uh, remains in a very strong position uh, with uh, the at least the European time zones, time zones number one financial centre. I, I, I realise that um, some positions have gone. I, I think not many, uh, but I am aware that uh, some parallel operations have been set up uh, within the EU, but I'm not seeing it as being a wholesale problem uh, for the UK financial services sector. And by the way, of course, balanced against that are the opportunities. Uh, we'll be making sure, or actually I will be making sure in our future free trade agreements uh, with other countries that financial services uh, play a real role uh, in those trade agreements. Um, so I'm always keen to hear um, from the industry uh, uh, what uh, barriers, trade barriers there are to UK financial services uh, beyond the EU uh, with our other partners, uh, probably most particularly at the moment, uh, the United States uh, and Japan. Thank you very much. And uh, Minister, just to add, it's Michael Sorry, Michael, yeah. Just to add to that, Minister, um, in answer to Javier's question, we've been doing a lot of work with the London Markets Group, as you would imagine, together with our colleagues in Treasury. Um, and, you know, are obviously very conscious of the point you make about the unique ecosystem 
that exists in London and the, you know, the fact that there isn't a, a concentration like it anywhere in, else in the world. So we're absolutely committed to doing what we can to uh, retain and to grow that ecosystem. Okay, thank you, Michael, thanks. Okay, um, I will group some questions since we are uh, in, the, in the last innings of the, of the meeting, so I will group some questions first. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce some questions by uh, from Adam Munday from Melia Hotels that uh, is symbolic because he would have uh, hosted this event if we had had it in, in physical format. He said that they are employing over 300 people in the UK across four hotels, another two being built in the north. They depend on the staff from overseas, especially for cleaning, food and beverage services. And his question is, uh, well, do you think the UK will continue to be an attractive place to work uh, after Brexit? Also related to that, uh, Josep, Josep Alvarez from Everest, he asked that UK produces 20,000 engineering graduates a year compared to 50,000 in Spain or 175 in Germany. Bearing in mind the cumbersome and expensive visa process, what is the strategy for the government for overcoming the, the future uh, lack of digital talent in, in technologies? Also, uh, in another topic, uh, Albert Colt uh, from Banco Sabadell asked, do you think that regulatory instructions like the one we've seen for the banking sector could extend across other sectors in order to preserve the product uh, fabric in the current crisis and in not regulated sectors uh, via uh, emergency, uh, emergency, and, uh, emergency legislation? And uh, finally, I, I had another uh, couple of questions. Uh, one uh, from Gonzalo Coelho that um, uh, as we approach the date, we do you see the order of negotiation in which say trading and manufactured goods can take priority um, above uh, trading of services. And, and also we have one, uh, one question uh, about and um, which uh, will be uh, the, the relationship, how do you see the relationship between the UK and China um, evolving? That, that, last, uh, that is the last question. I think we will have uh, time, time to, to answer. Yeah, uh, well, fantastic, Nacho. Right, let me rifle through those and I may call him uh, Michael just to add a, and perhaps a couple of bits on them. I think the uh, question of Amelia Hotels, first of all, uh, and thank you for, for having agreed to host this. And I'm sure we will <coughs> do this again uh, uh, in the original format, uh, perhaps uh, next year. Um, I think the UK will remain a very attractive place to work. Um, I, I think I'm right in saying the number of EU nationals today is not materially different to the number of EU nationals that were here uh, um, four years ago at the time of the referendum. I think the UK has m maintained its position in the track to place to come. We cannot take that for granted. Um, one of the advantages, of course, of the UK having its own migration policy, and you'll have seen the uh, major announcement, the launch of the points-based immigration system, uh, will be um, that we can can set up a migration policy that suits um, the United Kingdom. Um, that, I think, is the, one of the, the benefits uh, um, that can be brought uh, from leaving the European Union is actually being able to say set a migration policy um, that suits the UK. So I think in terms of listening to businesses like yours, uh, that is what we will be doing and making sure that that migration policy has got the right balance and make sure that we get the right people coming into the country. And thank you for your expansion uh, in the UK, uh, um, and uh, that's very much welcome. The question on engineering graduates, that is a really, really interesting question. And I think the industrial strategy published a couple of years ago um, reflects on that and the need to boost uh, STEM subjects in the UK. Uh, that has been an ongoing part of the government's work uh, for the last uh, 10 years. Um, the UK has never been as attractive a place for engineering graduates uh, as uh, other countries, and we need to boost that. My, my father was a, an engineer, and part of my family history is the reason I was born in the United States is 
He was a UK engineer who got lured uh, across the Atlantic uh, um, by um, better, uh, not just better wages, but also the, the best of where I think the Americans uh, respect doing as a profession. And that is something that we are working on improving. Uh, it will take a little bit of, um, I think, in terms of from Banco Sabadell about uh, extending um, support uh, beyond um, financial services to other sectors, if I understood the question correctly, and the potential for emergency legislation. Look, um, there's no plans at present for further emergency legislation. Um, the House of Commons uh, is in recess um, for the next uh, 20 days in any case. Uh, I think within that time, I think the government will be watching the situation very closely and to see if there's any need uh, to legislate uh, in any other areas. The question on manufactured goods and services, if I understood the question correctly, um, the priority given to them, and obviously the priority to, will be given to both, uh, is extremely important. I talked a little bit earlier about the flow of uh, both goods and services between the UK and Spain. Uh, clearly, the UK is the world's second largest uh, services exporter, uh, export uh, services exports will be an extremely important part uh, of our offer um, going forward. And finally, the really interesting question uh, on how the UK-China relationship will evolve. Well, I think it's a little bit early at the moment to see uh, where that uh, relationship uh, has been and will be going. Um, you know, China is uh, both a um, supplier now of uh, a lot of the uh, uh, medical production uh, that we need going forward. Um, so that is uh, performing an important role. But I'm sure questions will be asked uh, about uh, the origins of uh, COVID-19 and the spread of COVID-19. Uh, but that probably isn't a question uh, for me uh, as a trade minister uh, today uh, to be speculating on. But I think China's relationship with the UK uh, and with the rest of the world, I think, will be uh, uh, um, uh, one of the important areas uh, when this crisis uh, starts to pass. And, you know, obviously, we're not even at the peak of it yet. I think it will be one of the very interesting questions that people will want to uh, examine and uh, see what lessons can be learned. And I don't know if Michael wanted to add anything on any specific points. Um, just to comment on, on kind of um, regulation. So uh, we're in a very active phase at the moment, bring inputs from uh, investors and indeed in indigenous UK businesses to understand what easements government might offer to current rules and regulation. So if chamber members on this call have ideas on things which would lessen the current burden on those businesses as they react to the crisis, and then please feed those chamber and then they can feed those back into me. Uh, already a number of easements have been made, uh, but clearly uh, government is trying to do everything it can to ensure that businesses focus on what they should be focused on uh, during these unprecedented times. And, and the comment about engineers, uh, then clearly the points-based system, points-based immigration system, uh, we hope will be exactly the mechanism for uh, a, a attracting um, engineers, developers, wherever there might be a shortage. There is already a, a shortage occupation component to our immigration system, um, but equally going forward, uh, we'll be able to cast the net wider in terms of where we source skilled um, labour for the UK. Thank you, Michael. If I could just add to one final point, Nacho, if I may, and that is um, just my appeal for um, people to speak out um, for um, um, free trade uh, and against um, autarky, self-sufficiency, uh, protectionism, etc. I'm quite keen to um, for companies, uh, particularly international companies uh, like your membership, to speak out in this space. And if anybody wants to get involved uh, in our campaign, um, then please um, contact my office or, or, or email me at uh, hands, H-A-N-D-S, at trade.gov.uk. Uh, trade.gov.uk gets straight through to my office. We're, we're looking for people 
people to uh, um, um, speak up. I don't think this is uh, the big debate of uh, this week, but I think that will be uh, one of the debates that ensues um, from this crisis uh, will be in what sectors, in what degree um, do countries uh, uh, want to or need to feel they need to become sort of self-sufficient vis-a-vis what I think is the right answer, which is uh, a better diversity uh, and origin of sources of supply, if you follow me. So uh, if anybody wants to get involved in that campaign, please email my office. Perfect. Thank you very much, Greg. I think it has been a splendid uh, address and a uh, um, very active Q&A. We have still some some questions that we that we have not been able to address, but we will send it to, to send them to your office anyway. And I pass the word to to our president, Eduardo Barrachina, for some closing remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Nacho. And I, I want to thank everyone who joined today, um, particularly from Spain. That, that was one of the opportunities we were providing, in particular the Chamber of Commerce in Madrid, Camera de Comercio de Madrid, who's been extremely active in facilitating this, uh, this webinar um, across Madrid and the rest of the country. Um, some questions remain unanswered, not only in the chat, but in this new dialogue that we are having with the DIT. Minister, thank you ever so much for this insightful and technical um, 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 speech that you gave and, and, and for answering um, all the questions that were formulated. You must be pleased that uh, many of your constituents um, happen to be here. Um, unfortunately, I'm in Islington, which is a different habitat. Oh, uh, um, that's Jeremy Corbyn's it, constituency. Yes. <laughs> In any case, <laughs> uh, on behalf of the Chamber, Minister, um, thank you ever so much. Uh, any question which is not has not been able to be answered today, please uh, remain in touch with the Secretary General, Igor Urra, and we will feed the DIT um, um, and be able to facilitate any answer from the DIT. And we reiterate, uh, not only to our members, but also to the DIT, particularly you, Minister, today, and Michael Chatton, that we remain committed to walk together in these difficult times. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Nacho. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, and with this, I think we, we close the, the event. Thank you very much uh, to all all the attendants and as I said we will pass on all the questions that we have not been able to to address to the to the uh, minister and and with this we